So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala rasooli al-Kareem. Amma ba'd, fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, qala azza wa jal, laysa al-birra antu wallu wujuhakum qibla al-mashraqi wal-maghrib, walakin al-birra man amana billah ila akhir al-ayah. So today I want to talk about a concept called nominal, nominal, nominalism, sorry for my dyslexia, and ritualism. Alama Iqbal says in his poetry, The rituals are left, but the spirit of Islam is gone. It's dead. It's not, gone. It's, it's not there anymore. The spirit of Islam, the truth of Islam, is gone but the rituals are left you still see people praying you still see people doing Hajj you still see people fasting I'll give you an example of fasting fasting is about supposed to be about not eating food so that you'll attain taqwa but what do we do we don't eat food just like those people that were there on the Sabbath they didn't fish on the Sabbath but they made sure that they had the nets before there so they'll catch all the fish even on the Sabbath so we don't eat food in Ramadan in the time we're not supposed to eat it, but then we fill ourselves up afterwards. Meaning what? The ruh, the spirit, the soul, the purpose is gone. Then many of us, we fast like we're supposed to, but the spirit is gone because we don't fast in any other aspect. The tongue is saying the same words. The eyes are still looking at the same thing. The prayers are still being missed. Ramadan was supposed to be a month of Qur'an. Shahr Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. Shahr Ramadan, the month of Ramadan is the month in which Allah revealed the Qur'an. What happened? We stand for one hour while we argue, is it 8, is it 20? Okay? And we argue 8 and 20 for the Tarawih for the one hour that we're going to stand and the rest of the night. No Qur'an. No relationship with Qur'an is built during the month of Ramadan. Where is the spirit of Islam? Rasme ragayi. All the rituals are there. Ruhe balani nayrahi. The spirit is not there. The soul is not there. You go to Hajj. Hajj is there. But what is not there? The spirit of Hajj is not there. There is more commercialism than there is ibadah. Just look at the pictures of Hajj before and look at the pictures of Hajj now. Look at Mecca before and look at Mecca now. In fact, I'm going to do a video on that. <coughs> what is my point? Let me give you another example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is not just righteousness that you turn your faces to the east or the west. Allah is referring to the issue of the Qibla. If a masjid has a 10 degree off, oh my God, we're going to fight over that. Like we're such good and pious Muslims, we're going to make sure we get it absolutely right. If a sister comes into the masjid and she's not wearing hijab and she's not wearing the proper clothes, what is our attitude? Our attitude is, oh my God, she's not wearing hijab. Can some sisters please give her the right clothing so she'll dress? Subhanallah, here's a girl. She's coming to the masjid for maybe the first time, maybe to learn about Islam. And all you're concerned with is her head covering. You no longer look at the souls. You just look at the exterior. You want to talk about, uh, I mean, just all these issues, right? Me, this is nominalism at its par excellence. See, this is what happened during the Renaissance. What happened during the Renaissance is this idea that we look at particulars and we don't look at universals. Moralism is relative. This is your morals and this is your morals and this is your ideas and these are your ideas. There's no universals. And Islam believes in universals. Islam believes in Tawheed, oneness of Allah. And oneness of Allah in spirit should mean all human beings are equal, but Muslims are racists. One Allah means all human beings are equal. One Allah means all authority belongs to Allah. One Allah means we don't own anything. Allah owns everything. One Allah means we're all part of a same family from Adam and Eve is the only philosophical basis in which human beings can come together. But the point I'm trying to say here is, so what happened? 
if I fast forward now, is that when ritualism crept into Islam and the spirit was taken out of Islam, how, for example, riba. We don't want to take riba. I don't want to take riba. I don't want to take riba, but I'll do this other Islamic thing that's like riba, but, I, but you know, at least it's not riba. All the flaws of riba are in it. But you call it Islamic finance. This is the problem. The spirit of Islam is gone. You've compromised your law, your, your legality so much that nothing of the original remains. Nothing of the original remains. If Islam was to look at its face today, it would not recognize itself. You know, even just so that the point is made clear that even when we do wudu with the water from the faucets and you have all this chlorine and chloride when the wudu water you do is supposed to taste like its original source. It's supposed to smell like its original source. Now when you put water, you see this white thing before you see the water. You have added all these things that dilute the... Rea the, the and what is, the, what is it that's the problem? The same thing in medicine. You don't look at, you look at the eye and you look at the ear and you look at the nose and you look at the parts and you look at the symptoms. You don't look at the entire person. You don't look at the emotional, spiritual, physical, intellectual, the psyche, the entire spectrum of what a human being is. Before You don't look at the, the, the macro before you look at the specific. And that's the problem, is that Muslims, when they become ritualistic, when you become like me and my sheikh are going to Jannah and I don't know about you, right? Then what has happened is you're looking at particulars. You've become nominalistic. You've become atomized. Just you're looking at the particulars before you're looking at the bigger picture. And this is the problem that's happened with, authentic, with what is authentic Islam. Islam is authentic Islam has fallen into its own ritualism its own nominalism, which is a gift the Western thought has given to the Muslims in a sense because this is what Western Renaissance promoted. That the, and when you read the Quran, the Quran always promotes the universal over the specific and our tradition always promoted the universal over the specific. Like for example, the Quran says, Rabbu samawati wal ard. Look at the heavens and then the earth. Look at the big picture and then look at the specific. And you'll find this style in the Quran over and over. So, what has happened? We've become ritualistic. If today somebody was to put an idol in front of me while I'm praying, I'd be like, no, I don't care. I don't care. If, if, if the government puts an idol in front of me, I don't care. I just have to do my prayer. I'm just going to do my prayer. That's it. I don't care. My intention has nothing to do with the prayer. I have nothing to do with the idol. I'm just going to pray. Just like that, we say about Hajj. I'm going to go do my Hajj. I didn't do my Hajj. I better do my Hajj. And you're going to go do your Hajj. Not realizing your prayer and your Hajj and your fasting are all compromised. Because until the reestablishment of the Deen doesn't happen, until the reestablishment of the Khilafah doesn't happen, until the re-establishment of the true Islamic civilization and the Islamic spirit, you know, even people that want to establish Khilafah, it's also ritualistic. They, they all are looking at just the rules, the structure, and they're not concerned with the spirit. This is what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that there will be masajid, big mas masjids in the end of times, and they will be beautiful. But they will be devoid of huda. They will be devoid of guidance. It's all ritualistic. It's all for show. What is this big masjid doing for show? How many big masjids we have that are big masjids and no one gets along in the entire masjid? Everyone, the musalliyins, don't get along with the board of directors. How many places that happens? People don't get along in the masjid. But you got this big masjid, a beautiful masjid. You don't have any activities in the masjid. Kharabu min al huda. Devoid of any guidance. What did the Prophet say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? La yabqa min al islami illa ismahu. Nothing will remain of Islam except the name Islam will remain. Where can you see Islam today? Not in one inch in the world you can see the universalities of the establishment of Islam. 
and where you do have some hope for Islam, what is the Islam there? Do you have a beard? Do you have the, do you have the imama? You don't even know what the issues are. You don't even know what the universal issues are. The people are more interested in whether my sect is right or your sect is right while atheism is consuming the Muslim youth. You have no idea of what the bigger priorities are, what the universals are, what the priority, what is more important than less important. You become ritualistic. And because of this ritualism, our kids are losing, losing Islam. Because of this ritualism, because of this nominal, nominalism, I'll give you even in the fiqh, for example. Quran says, Qulu lil nasi husna, say good things to people. The Quran says, Kalimatin tayyibatin ka shajaratin tayyibatin asluha thabitun wa farruha fis sama. A good word is like strongly rooted in, this, in the ground and is, it's like trees are root, meeting the heavens. That's the universal. Say good word. But what will happen? You forget about the universals and then you have some of the Shia. They're cursing this companions of the Prophet. They think that's a, that's a good thing to do. That's good ritual for them. That's, they're thinking they're getting rewards from Allah by going against narrations that have no authenticity compared to a universal in the Quran. قُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna. Say good things to people. The universal is to say good about the dead. So I'm just using that as an example, that this is the type of mentality that we have. You know, I remember I was in uh, Azhar, and one of the shiuch asked me, there was some sort of conference happening, I, I was very young. And uh, so, you know, sometimes people were like, oh, that kid, he's from America, he's from America. So I sat, and then I was talking to one sheikh, he was like a teacher at the university, I was sitting by him, there was a conference, some big sheikh were talking, and he was there, and I was there, and he asked me, min wayn anta, ana min America, I'm from America, oh, okay, okay, walid tu fi America, wa abi wa min Pakistan, you know, I was born in uh, America, but my mom and dad are from uh, Pakistan, and uh, he's like, oh, okay, next, what's the next question, uh, what mazhab do you follow? Uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really Hanafi because I was born and that's what I was taught. What did he do? After that, the conversation ended. He's like, hmm, you don't follow Imam Shafi. That's it. This is the ritualism. The ritualisticness of things are so much. You give the adhan. You say, Allahu Akbar. But all around you, Allah is not Akbar. You're breaking every rule of the Sharia. Every banking rule, every rule. Where is, يعني, what are you saying? What are you, this is why Alama Iqbal, the same Alama Iqbal also said, Mullah ki azaor, Mujahid ki azaor. Mullah, when Mullah says, meaning the scholar, he doesn't mean to demean the scholar, but he's trying to make a point. That, the mullah, when he says Allahu Akbar in the adhan to call people to prayer, that is something different. But when the mujahid, he says Allahu Akbar, that is something different. This is ritualistic, this has spirit. Right? The purpose of my life is so that the deen of Allah becomes supreme. Islima Muslima, Islima Namazi. This is why I'm Muslim, this is why I pray. I pray to surrender to Allah, and I pray to make, as I submit to Allah, I want the world around me to submit, the earth that belongs to Allah to submit to Allah. This is the spirit of Islam. Where is the spirit of, the Sahaba, they had the spirit of Islam. They weren't doing rituals. If you pray five times a day, it's, it's, Islam has rituals, but the point is to make the rituals into a meaningful act. Because you may not be able to do it every day, but you're doing it consistently. And consistency is also important in establishing and developing character. But with the consistency, that also means that more and more of the spirit that I'm standing before Allah. How many people pray to Allah as if they're standing before Allah? How many people pray as if this might be their last prayer? 
How many people pray rem uh, thinking that maybe uh, the, uh, that you know the angel of death is behind me and that the hellfire is in front of me? How many people pray with the spirit of Islam? Forget about anything else. Forget about ruling and justice of Islam. The problem is that the Western world came with this idea of nominalism, where in schools, what are kids first taught? They're first taught the atom. You know, the atom is one of the first basic principles of what's the building blocks of the universe, of the non-living world, the atom. So they teach you the atom. And then what's the building blocks of life cell? So they teach you about the cell in the second and the third grade. They teach you about the atom in the second and third grade. <coughs> they teach you to think in particulars rather than universals. And Islam is a religion of universality. Islam is a religion that prioritizes things based upon universals. And the Muslims have become ritualistic and they've become nominalistic. And the result is that they're fragmented. They're devoid of the spirit of Islam. And we are all breaking apart and the fitans are coming down, the difficulties are coming down because what? We've lost the spirit of Islam. When people get married, they talk about, what are my rights? Are you joking? That's not what you need to know. What are your rights? You need to know what is the spirit of being a husband? What is the spirit of being a wife? Oh, these are my rights as a wife. These are my rights as a husband. That's bogus. That'll never fix anything. That just puts you in a state of where you can be e egotistically demand what is yours. But the spirit of being a husband means how you have to give up and be selfless to the other, to your wife. And the spirit of being a wife means how you have to give up your rights even to make your husband happy. Maybe you'll be the first one to say sorry. So we've become like the West. Me particular individualism, particularism, atomization, nominalism, devoid of universalism. There's, and with, with that, there's no collectivity. There's no jama'ah. It's just about me, what I think, what is my morality, what I feel like. I'm a nomad Muslim. I'm a Muslim with no one, and shaitan is my friend. That's what the Prophet said. The one who's alone, shaitan is with him. You can't, لا خير لما لا يعلف ولا يعلف. There's no good in the one who doesn't get along with other people. But in order to get along with other people, you have to have some spirit, some soul, some ruh. But you want to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, and you want to tell the people, don't tell me anything. And then let's take this further. Everyone thinks they're a good person. How can the world be decent? Tell me. How can the world be decent? when there's so much suffering happening in the world and the whole world stands by and says nothing. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask that baby, Bi ayi dham bin khutilat, for what reason were you killed? What will you say to your decency at that time? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask that baby that was aborted, that the mother wanted to abort the baby because she didn't want to lose her shape, but because she thinks she's a decent human being. That mother who does abortions, or those mothers that did abortions, and likewise caused suffering in other parts of the world, and just stood by, didn't even acknowledge the suffering that they caused. You think people in the West are decent people, while they've caused suffering to millions and millions and billions of people in the, around the world? That when this person who thinks he's decent, Allah, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this picture and he goes to his people thinking he's so cool he's so awesome I'm so decent I'm so good but on the day of judgment Allah will raise all the people to, to, to make a claim against his claim of decency when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask them that if you were a decent person then how come all of you never even acknowledge the, the, the cry of this person the Prophet said وسلم, to make a little, ba little girl happy, you get the reward of the man who cried out of the fear of Allah. There's a little girl in your masjid, she's running around, you give her a little candy, make her happy, you get the reward of what? Of like the person who cried in front of Allah out of the fear of Allah. The spirit is gone, the smile is gone, the prophetic model is gone. 
and we think we're decent. And you know why we're told in, in this whole world of moral uh, relativity, what happens as a result of moral relativity, what happens of, because of uh, this nominalism? Well, you know, it's just, uh, yeah, I have my morals, you have your morals, you have your group, you have your ideas, we're all decent people. You know why we are all made to feel we're decent? We're all made to feel we're decent because that is a necessary condition for buying and selling to happen at a, at a faster and faster pace without feeling bad. If I was bad, then, and if I felt guilty about being bad, and I felt sorry that I'm causing harm somewhere else in the world, and just look at the world today. Just a few miles away is a war, and a few miles away, everything's at peace. Look at Syria. You know, just look at Yemen. Look at so many of these countries. Look at Somalia today, right? There's a famine. There's, uh, uh, Somalia could have been the bed basket, bread basket of the world, but they didn't allow it. Because why? Because, uh, you know, Islam can come there. Islam can happen. So, you know, who, who's to, who, is, who are these decent people around the world? Right? That their, their decency will be challenged on the Day of Judgment by their claimants. These people didn't acknowledge our tears. These people stood silent. These people never did anything. These people thought they're decent. Allah will bring up one person who says he's decent. Oh, you know, I could, I was, I'm a decent person, never did anything wrong. Oh, yeah. Did your taxes go to support wars? Did your, uh, did you uh, support your government? Did you ever even say that this is what's happening in the world is wrong? Did you even say it? Did you shed a tear? Did you even feel guilty that this is happening because of, that you're living in a system that is causing this corruption, that you're part of this corruption? Your claim to decency has no value, you're impious. This is what's happening. Muslims, they don't want to establish khilafah, but they want to go pray and do hajj and do fasting without the ummah being established. What, there's no spirit in that. How can you uh, focus on these rituals when you're not working for the spirit of Islam, for the establishment of Islam, for the establishment of the khilafah? What claims do you have to decency? That when in the last month, I think almost 12 to 15 people died in Palestine. Did anybody care? Did anybody talk about it? How many khatibs talked about it? No, they're going to do their ritual khutbah, put everybody to sleep, like it always happens, put everyone to sleep doing your khutbahs, dumbify everybody by never raising the real issues, don't talk about the elephant in the room, don't wake up the people, don't actually educate the people with the Qur'an. Because, why? Because you're a coward. And the person who is a coward has no spirit, has no soul, has no life. And you know, uh, one of the sheikhs was saying that there's so many people, that there are more people alive in their graves than there are people outside the graves. Because their soul is dead, but they think they're decent people. And there are people in their graves, they died for the true cause. And they're more alive in their graves, they have more life than these people that are outside the grave. So, I mean, I could go on and I want to talk about nominalism and ritualism and how this has hurt us as an ummah and we're in disarray. And, you know, we are in this kind of like uh, uh, a situation of, of complete, we have no clear picture. We're, we're in this situation of disarray because why? Because we're not in, interested, we're interested in the rituals and we're interested in power. Let's, you know, get political clout. Let's get political clout no matter at what cost. You're interested in power. You're just interested in, you're just interested in the mechanics of things. You're not interested in, in the real, uh, the real soul of things, the ruh of things. And so now Muslims are all with the donkey with the Democrats, where all the, the LGBT community is, all the atheists are, and this is where the majority of the Muslims are now? What has the uh, a donkey ever done for the black people or the Hispanic people in this country that Muslims are so stupid? I would rather do what Quran says, Ya Ahlul Kitab, be open, try to open the doors with the people of the book. Try to establish relationships with them. Those of the people of the book that want that are open to us, we should that that those should be that you know what real politics is? Real politics is changing the minds of the hearts of the people by doing da'wah, by introducing them to Islam and our common values. 
That's not going to happen in the donkey system, the Democratic Party that we have here in the United States. Are you joking? Try for a million years. Only a dumb fool thinks that they'll ever be able to convince these people that we're on the same page. They know you're not on the same page. They're using you for them. And once they achieve their uh, purposes of LGBT and so on and so forth, you're going to be the first one kicked out. They'll be most violent against you. So we think in particulars without universals. And one of the aspects of that is that Muslims in America, they think about only Muslims in America without thinking about Muslims around the world. Whereas the, the alim, okay, even though the alim is working according to his locality, but his concern is what is happening globally. He's not looking at Muslims in America completely different from Muslims like in, in China or Muslims in Pakistan or Muslims in Russia. No. Because we're rajulun wahid, the prophets. We're like one body. And what do Muslims in America want to do? What do Muslims in Britain want to do? What do Muslims in the West want to do? Or what do Muslims in Pakistan want to do? Or Bangladesh want to do? Or Turkey want to do? Or Indonesia and Malaysia? What do they all want to do? They want to become particular. I, you know, we're just, we're just our own little thing. And so, what needs to be done as a response? There needs to be a type of global movement. Many jama'as with many emirs not because they're great people, but this is because what it needs needs to be done. We need to bring back the spirit of Islam, the ruh of Islam, the taqwa of Allah, the fear of Allah, the primary things, the maqasid of sharia, the things that are sacred in the sharia, in the maqasid, the people's lives, Muslims killing Muslims, when life of a Muslim is sacred, the wealth of the Muslims is sacred. The Prophet said it's sacred. The honor of a Muslim is sacred. The, the genes of a Muslim is sacred. And what are we doing? We're playing with our genes. We're letting other people take our genes and, and disseminate it and use it and to analyze it into the, all this uh, COVID uh, thing that happened. They're just, everyone took our genes. Genes are supposed to be sacred. You can't play around with genes. You can't just do biogenetic engineering just like that without any thought, especially if you think it's going to be in the wrong hands. But no. Muslims are more interested in progress than to seeing what is ethically correct because the spirit is gone. And if you tell a Muslim that, you know, if Muslims had created an Islamic civilization, we probably wouldn't have created a civilization that was divorced from nature. Maybe we would have had something like a car, but not something that would have been bad for the environment. Maybe we would have had real horses, but they might have ran in a way, like on a treadmill or something, that causes the horse to go 10 times, 20 times faster. We could have created technologies that were in, co in, in harmony with nature. But who's going to think about that? Maybe we're completely going off on the wrong direction in terms of technology. No one's going to think about that because we're so interested in the particulars. We're, we're not looking at the universals anymore. And so I'll end here. I think I've said enough. وللسائر المسلمين والمسلمات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته